Good afternoon, everyone. My name's James Curran. I'm the Academic Director of the Australian Computing Academy at the University of Sydney. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this afternoon's webinar. Um, and ask me anything or in uh, old speak question and answer session um, with the Australian Curriculum Digital Technologies co-authors. Very excited to be bringing the band back together again today. And, and what a time to be talking about digital technologies with the announcement from ACARA last week that the digital technologies or technologies more generally is gonna get a bit of a brush up um, in the next little while. And that's one of the things we'll be talking about. Um, if you'd like to ask a question today, we're just gonna use the, um, the chat rather than the Q and A facility. That way other people can see your questions as you're asking them. We've had a few people ask questions um, as part of the registration process and we've thrown a few things in ourselves um, as well. But if you've got any questions, feel free to um, stake your claim early and start putting those questions in the chat window and we'll get ourselves started at five past, so two minutes time. All right, so um uh, let's get underway i'm going to start by uh inviting each of my co-presenters to introduce themselves so if you did just arrive late um, my name is james curran i am an associate professor at the university of sydney and the academic director of the australian computing academy i also run grok learning and do a bunch of other things and uh today uh, we're talking in the capacity as uh, one of the authors of the Australian Curriculum Digital Technologies. Now, before I hand over, I'm going to just show you, well, you can't see it on the screen because we're still screen sharing, but you're going to hear this noise. <coughs> this is the noise I'm going to uh, play if one of my co-presenters goes past two minutes in answering their questions. So the goal is to be quick fire today. That noise, let's, um, let's get rid of the um, screen share now, Bruce. Um, uh, that noise, unfortunately, is the, um, is the first toy my son, Thomas, who's literally two weeks older than the curriculum, so nearly um, turning eight. Um, uh, this is the first thing he ever bought with his pocket money. Absolute horrid thing to have in the house, but great for these purposes. So two minutes, they're going to get no warnings. They're going to have to wrap up their answer so we can keep it quick fire. And I do that before people's introductions because I know Bruce's introduction could last several minutes. All right, Paula, over to you first. Thank you. I'm from Victoria. I was um, formerly employed by the Victorian Curriculum and Assessment Authority. I've retired from full-time work, but still have an absolutely wonderful time working with my um, colleagues on this writing team. And, and Paula, we are so glad that you are doing a very bad job of retiring indeed. <laughs> Anna, Thank you, James. Over to you. Hello, everyone. My name's Anna Kinane, and I'm joining you from Brisbane. And uh, I am the Project Manager Digital Strategies at the Queensland College of Teachers. Um, this is my 36th year in education, and 22 of those years spent uh, teaching uh, in primary classrooms throughout Queensland. Um, I was very excited to be uh, invited to be one of the writers joining uh, Paula Bruce and James uh, about seven years ago or yep. longer. Yep. Thanks, Anna. And uh, everyone, here's a challenge for you for Anna. Anna is an absolute gun of connecting any other content in the curriculum to digital technologies. I challenge you to find a bit of the curriculum anywhere uh, in primary uh, and watch her as she... Uh, uh, climbs the high wire and still connects the two things together live on national television. There's a challenge for you. Bruce, over to you. Hi, I'm Bruce Feuder. I'm in Canberra. I uh, have been teaching for 15 years and before joining the ACA and working on this stuff was a teacher in high schools in Canberra um, and joined the writing team after being on the advisory group to provide some much needed fresh ideas. When they <laughs> Fresh ideas. Oh, the around. first... The first salvo has been launched. Wow. <laughs> Hanging around uh, just, just to bring an, an, an extra perspective to the team during the um, <laughs> post consultation, post the public consultation. So yeah, um, yeah it's, it's good to get involved and to contribute. 
we we were very glad to have Bruce come on board because it allows us to say anything that we were unhappy happy in the final wording, like the glossary, for example. Um, we can uh, we can blame Bruce for. Um, so let's uh, let's get started straight into the the questions then. So this first question I'm going to hand to everyone, um, but we're going to try and do these fairly quick fire. If you've got questions or follow ups, then please feel free to. Um, uh, uh, ask questions in the chat. So first question comes from Michelle, Michelle Chomiak. Um, and Michelle, I've slightly reworded your question. There's confusion between digital technologies, the ICT capability, and a number of subjects mentioned digital technologies in lowercase. How do we avoid that confusion, confusion? And what would we have liked to have called digital technologies if we had the choice? Paula, I'll start with you. Um, Victoria put the proposal up that it be computing and digital technology, CDT. In Victoria, we refer to it as Digitech rather than DT. Um, I normally bang on about uppercase, lowercase. It's an issue. And um, ICT is not mentioned basically in any other learning area. Other learning areas refer to digital technologies as the hardware and software, but computing and digital technologies was Victoria's preference. Thank you, Paula. Anna? Well, I was going to say the same thing, computing, and the reason being in Queensland in particular, I've spent the last four years, maybe five years, helping teachers understand and differentiate between the difference between digital technologies, lowercase talking about devices and systems, et cetera, uh, and the discipline of digital technologies. And Paula has a brilliant slide she shares with people and it just shows the difference when we're talking about lowercase, we're not talking about the discipline. And then I talk a little bit about curriculum literacy because in each of the learning areas, because we were the last cabs off the rank, digital technology is actually articulated differently in the learning areas. So that adds another layer of confusion, but uh, there's my response. Thanks, Anna. Bruce? Yeah, look, I, um, I know that a lot of the subjects or names like computing studies, for example, carry with them quite a bit of baggage. So I did want it to be different. I don't like digital technologies. I, I don't mind informatics. Um, but I, I guess you could argue that the, the digital technologies curriculum that we've developed is much broader than say computer science or informatics might be. So yeah, look, I, I don't really have a nice solution, unfortunately, um, but I don't like the term as it is and would have preferred to have seen some sort of combination of computer science, informatics, um, networking. Yeah, it would have needed a little bit more time and thought, I think. Yeah, so <clears throat> I think, I mean, for me, the, the name is a vexed question because we are teaching a continually evolving field. Um, uh, there's not really any question about what science, maths and English uh, should, be, should be called. Um, and I think both the joy and the, the uh, challenges of teaching digital technologies is that every few years uh, we do broaden or we do change our um, emphasis as a discipline and that makes it hard to come up with a good name. I quite like informatics. Um, uh, it's a term mostly used in Europe um, to mean the broader sense of managing and understanding how information is manipulated. Um, and, and I quite like that because there are many elements like data representation that we go far past the curriculum. I think probably the most important thing though is really to just understand the difference between the um, the subject, digital technologies and the ICT uh, capability. Um, uh, probably if I had to choose, I'd, I would probably have changed the name of the ICT capability first um, rather than the name digital technologies. I think digital literacy would have been a better name, but apparently one cannot use literacy twice in your list of capabilities. So um, we ended up with the ICT capability. Um, I want to point people to, in, in terms of an activity that I think really helps students and teachers understand the difference between the two is a set of cards that we've released in the ACA. If you've been to our webinars before, you would probably have seen them. I'm just gonna whack a link to them in the chat now. Um, and basically these cards on one side have um, a particular topic, uh, like for example, spreadsheets. And then on the other side, it will talk about whether that's 
in digital technologies or the ICT capability or just to mess with your head a little bit, both in some instances. So that's a, a good way of getting started. Thanks for the question to get us rolling, uh, Michelle. All right, so the next question, Anna, I'm going to send to you first. This is from uh, Chris uh, Scripco. Um, uh, suggestions for a beginning point in the junior years. Where would you get started? Okay, so that's a really exciting place, um, I think, to be as a uh, teacher because there's multiple opportunities to link and align with other learning areas. So, for example, if you're starting off in prep or foundation year one and you've got access to some BBOTs, perfect opportunity to align with mathematics when we're looking at early algorithmic thinking. We could, uh, while the students are playing with the little devices, we could look at um, geometry and measurement when we are looking at transformation and location. Uh, the wonderful uh, directional literacy where we're talking about uh, directions, um, forward, backward, left, right. Um, getting the students to actually engage in some of the language about uh, giving and receiving instructions. Um, when we're in that same um, mode about, uh, I suppose, concept about algorithms, if we look at the history curriculum from F to 2, the students look very closely at their own family and their um, people around them and sequencing events in their life. So their birthday, when Christmas is, Easter, their first... Um, uh, the time they lost their first tooth, etc. So nice um, opportunity to put events in order. And while they're doing this, um, they are engaging in the digital technologies curriculum when we're starting to get that early algorithmic thinking going on. If we look at data, particularly in science and mathematics, when we could be looking at the collection of data, talking about data, what is data, some simple little science investigations, like a data detective looking at um, how many pets you might have. Oh, is my time up already? Okay, I could go on forever. This but, is why we've got it, because otherwise the very first question we'd still be talking about the name after 50 minutes. Now, to be clear, the rules are you're allowed to finish the sentence. You don't just need to cut yourself off instantly. So uh, look, although, uh, Paula, I know that some of your sentences can last up to 50 minutes, so maybe that rule doesn't apply to you. I, I will finish by just saying um, the in the early years, there are multiple opportunities to align to the other learning areas. But remember, you are going to have to assess and report in Digitech. So don't forget that important message. Yeah. Paula, do you want to add anything to that one? No, that's fine. I'm reserving my extra oh. time for when oh, I, I speak. See. And I just oh. ran off and got a hooter to put you on a two minute time. <laughs> well, I was going to add just a very quick thing, which is to say, I think you should start to integrate with other things that you're confident in. If you're a superstar teacher, um, in um, English or in um, mathematics, and that's where you really get fired up. That's a great place for you to be starting to teach um, digital technologies, and you should just find the bits of the curriculum that, that you find naturally tie in with that. Yeah. If you're doing something that's new and you're not so confident about it, pair it with something that you really think you're on top of. Good. All right, on to the next question, and this one comes to you, Paula. Um, this is from Tricia. Uh, Lonigan, is the intent to combine knowledge and understanding content descriptions with processes and production skills when writing units? Uh, Tricia says that she finds her units often have only one or the other type, but her colleagues have argued they must be together. What was intended when we wrote the curriculum? Um, thanks for it. That was a, a very good question. The writers never wanted to have strands because we viewed that all of the content had some type of connection. They were individual parts which together formed the total curriculum. A concern is the atomizing approach that some people just take one content description, do it, move on to the next. They are best joined at least two or three together. And following from what James is saying, I think as starting points, take what you consider to be like a major um, content description, select something which might be the minor, and that's the one that you're not quite as confident with. So you might put digital um, systems together with data. And then as that confidence builds, you then add on, you drop your major back to a minor, 
you elevate your minor and you take a new one on. So we would certainly be saying that just in a unit focusing on one of them, particularly if that's the basis of assessment, is not reflecting the intention of the curriculum. And I really would go back and have a look at what the aims are of the curriculum so that you get a more overarching um, viewpoint. So yes, you might in some learning focus on a couple of individual things, but then they are knitted together. So what we want is a coherent um, program. And um, I wouldn't say that must is all the time, but um, doing one at a time is not the intention of the curriculum. Yeah, and I think it's worth just adding, we fought really hard to have just one. Uh, we didn't want the split because everything that you would consider as knowledge and understanding, we expect there to be a, a practical use of that knowledge. Mm. And so separating them out, there's nothing like, um, you know, name the eight planets in digital technologies. Everything is something that you want to use to do something. And we didn't really want that separation. In the end, um, the compromise was, you'll see that there are only two content descriptions that ever sit above the line. So in knowledge and understanding, and the rest are down in processes and production skills. I want to point out one other thing though, very quickly. It could be that you could have some great units that have the separation you've described. Um, it's not that it, it definitely has to be, you know, there's no must about it, must, but yeah. there are natural combinations that exist above and below the line together, but also just above the line and just below the line. So either would be feasible. Thanks, Tricia. All right, so moving on to a question from uh, Jeanette Lacey. Uh, this one's to Bruce. Uh, uh, she would like to know where and how to get uh, data sets for teaching students databases. Yeah, thanks for that, Jeanette. I think one of the things that teachers are constantly looking for are ways that they can engage students with those data um, collection, data interpretation aspects of the curriculum. And one of the ways that I've always done it, and it's something we've looked at extensively in the ACT with the recent introduction of our data science course in year 11 and 12, is where can we go to actually you know, find things like this? And um, I think one really nice thing to do is take a look at the SQL course that exists in Grok Learning. I, was one, the, I put that together when I was doing some work for Grok at one point, and the emphasis was really on finding easy to navigate and access data sets that were pre-cleaned for the students so that they could just get in and actually do the things we want them to be doing in the curriculum. Um, uh, Linda McIver, who is at the Australian Data Science Education Institute, she does a really good job at actually doing a lot of cleaning up of data sets and then building lessons around them and making them available to, to teachers. And I think that's another brilliant resource. Um, and just getting a sense of the different ways that, that we've approached that is a good way to do it. There are a number of other resources out there like Gapminder and Google Open Data Sets and um, you know, even places like the Australian government and ACT government, I know, post a lot of their data sources online. The only thing I would say about those particular sources is that you can spend a long time cleaning that data up to make it accessible to students. So. Before you do that, definitely investigate the data sources you're hoping to use. Uh, talk students or demonstrate the basics of how to filter out the data that you, that you can't use for whatever reason, or narrow the focus and tell the students to apply specific filters so that they're working with data sets they can manage. Um, if they're interested in something, you'll be able to find a data set for it. Uh, it'll often be a case early on though that you'll just need to work with the students to find something that they're going to be able to, to actually use um, without having to do a lot of pre-processing. Yeah, and I mean on that front, um, Bruce, uh, when he was working with us in Grok, created an intro to um, SQL, introduction to SQL course. Um, like all Grok, Grok learning content, that's freely available for teachers to use for their own professional development. Um, obviously, if you've got a Grok subscription, you can have your students do that course, but feel free to take and use that data outside of the Grok learning platform. Bruce has done, found some really great and diverse data sets to use, and all of that data is already in a form that's clean and, and ready to use. But you, you can't underestimate the amount of time 
uh, that you might spend doing cleaning, especially if students are still fairly new to, to the kind of programming you need to do to clean up text data in particular. Speaking of which, I, I discovered today um, a new, well, I think it's a newish link where you can actually download the entire Australian curriculum um, as a series of JSON uh, data files. So uh, as, a, as a complete data nerd myself, I was like, oh, finally, I don't need to manually copy these across into spreadsheets for, for processing and so on. It's all there on the Australian curriculum website. So there's interesting data all over the place. Um, okay, thanks, Bruce. So, um, uh, next question is from uh, Roger Perrett. Um, Anna, I'm going to give this one to you. How can I differentiate for students I have in my class that are at an extremely low ability compared to the rest of the class, e.g. year two level? How can I teach them about data transfer, binary compression, or how to code? Okay, so look, any question about differentiation, you've got to actually look at the students in front of you and uh, the context. So what I would suggest is that first and foremost, we want all of our students to have an experience of success. We don't want students to actually disengage and to find it most frustrating and annoying and just completely um, turn off regardless of the learning area. So what I would suggest not knowing your students and not knowing your circumstance. If you've got diverse learners in your um, class, which we all have, but if they're extreme, I think there are some fantastic um, examples. On the ACA uh, website, for example, some of the challenges, like if we took the Smart Garden for an example, um, there would be opportunities, I would say, this is what I would do, I would work, I would get my students working collaboratively with some of those students who are really um, capable and competent, working with some of those students that were less capable and finding some of the things that they were interested in. So for example, uh, the, the more competent students might be able to use the um, other students' um, input as perhaps a design for a user interface for a quiz or a game, um, encourage them um, and make them feel um, excited about their input and that everyone has a, um, you know, a, a, a role to play. If you look at the scope and sequence um, document, it, it shows us what comes before, where we're heading. And in any um, differentiation, we are always looking at um, organising our learning programs, our units, to make sure every student experiences success. So I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not giving you any specific examples there, but I think what you need to do is just be mindful of whatever digital activity or um, problem you might be engaging in is to make sure all students have an opportunity to demonstrate some type of learning and that scope and sequence will help you. Even if you have to go back to the year uh, F to two juncture, that's perfectly acceptable if that's where some of those students are operating at. Thanks, um, Anna. I think I mean, Kenny has just linked the the two um, smart garden activities, and that reminded me that one of the key things you can do with a lot of the ACA activities, of course, is there's a Python version and a Blockly version. So you might either, if you're teaching in primary, you might have to extend some students that are really getting through visual programming quickly and are ready to jump into Python, or if you're teaching in secondary, um, and you've got some kids that maybe have done no programming at pri in primary because they're, that your feeder schools really aren't um, up to speed with digital technologies yet. I think it's perfectly acceptable in that context to have a class where some students are doing visual programming, other students are doing Python programming and so on. So some of the activities I think can help with that. The other thing is you can always use extra scaffolding. It, it never hurts for some students to be given a fragment of code um, and asked to modify it. Um, and I think Anna's point before about getting kids to work together, one of the best learning experiences I think you can have as a more capable student is the opportunity to explain your thinking to someone who's still struggling. So that that is actually, um, uh, isn't just good for the for the student who needs more help. It's actually a real opportunity for the stronger student as well. So that's a good one. I did, um, Bruce. You want to add something? Yeah, I did. And and I think basically for me, the other thing that I think we kept in mind when we designed the cybersecurity resources that we developed at the ACA were 
how can we make sure that the concepts are accessible, even if the skills may be beyond that student's capability at the time? So when we designed the um, cryptography challenge in, in cyber, we made sure that for each of the uh, activities that we designed, that was a programming activity. So for example, building a rotation cipher, we had a JavaScript element that allowed students to explore that concept, get a sense of how it worked, really demonstrated the underlying principles so that even if they weren't able to write the code, they could still understand the concept and the idea. And a really great resource for a lot of those types of concepts and ideas is actually CS Unplugged. Um, some of the uh, computer science concepts that are in the Australian curriculum have activities that um, have been essentially reworked so that the principles are able to be explored by students who are very young. Um, you can have students who are, you know, seven or eight years old engaging with, with computer science concepts that are often reserved for, you know, early years um, university level study. Um, and, you know, they're not going to be able to, you know, leave and, and write code to, you know, traverse a directed graph or anything when they're seven years old, but they'll at least understand what the idea is. And, and I think those are the types of resources you want to be looking for if you're looking at ways that you can make concepts accessible to kids with less experience. You beat the hippo by two seconds, Bruce. I know. I'm that good. <laughs> um, so uh, there's, there's a lot of different activities. I think a couple of people have mentioned some other things in chat. Don't be afraid to have different students um, working on different activities at the same time in class. The stronger students will appreciate the opportunity to be pushed further. And the students that are really just grappling with the concepts themselves, that's exactly the thing that we need students to do first. Absolutely. Can, can I just add one thing, James? And mm -hmm. this is really important to remember. You are the, the teacher. You are the, um, you have 100% um, influence over how engaging the curriculum can, can be. You may have had no influence over the content, but you have all the impact on how that, how, how engaging and how exciting the curriculum can be for students. So that, that's your um, big challenge. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Anna. Um, all right, uh, this next question is from Claire Walker. I'm gonna hand it to Bruce first. Um, should every task in digital technologies be framed as a problem? What other pedagogy works well in digital technologies? What activities, assessments, teaching practice do you recommend in year nine and 10 to better pre prepare students for digital solutions in year 11 and 12? So that's a, that's a Queensland question. The hint was given there with digital solutions. What do you reckon, Bruce? Well, I mean, there's a lot in that question. So that's I think- That's right. And the, uh, the hippo says two minutes, my friend. Yeah, I know. So, so I think what I'm gonna start with is talking about the, whether or not every task should be a problem. I don't think it needs to be. Um, there's a big push in a lot of learning circles for project-based learning to be a sort of driving pedagogy in schools. Um, and one of, the, one of the criticisms I have of that approach generally is that if you don't have fundamental skills that allow you to engage with something in a meaningful way, um, being faced with a project that is extremely open can actually be an extremely daunting thing. So uh, even if you're working in a PBL type context, it's important that you undertake as a teacher um, the thinking necessary to build some really good student Direct, uh, teacher directed resourcing and explicit teaching resources that will actually make sure that those fundamentals are solid. And that's consistent regardless of what year level you're in. So if you're in year nine and 10 and you're preparing students for digital solutions in year 11 and 12, what you really want to be looking for is where the content, there's a progression of content or common content between the two, because as we know, year nine and 10 is elective in many jurisdictions as well. So it does mean that students may not necessarily have done year nine and 10 before they do the senior secondary subjects. But in Queensland in particular, look for those common elements between those two, make sure you're teaching that explicitly in year nine and 10, as well as providing students with opportunities to explore those in an applied sense through projects. And that way, when they're in year 11 and 12, those teachers are able to reinforce and extend those concepts before they embark on projects themselves. That's the key. <laughs> you know what? I was just kind to you there. You're three seconds over. Um, uh, one thing I wanted to, to add back on the, the first question about framed as a problem, um, because we had so few words in writing the content 
descriptions themselves or so few words available in our budget, um, uh, we often use problem where really what we'd like to say is problem, need or opportunity. So I think, you know, uh, not everything needs to be uh, a problem that is already clearly exists or defined. You know, one could argue something like Facebook. Uh, uh, was did the problem actually really exist beforehand or was that an opportunity that was identified? Um, sure, further down the line, that's presented a whole lot of new opportunities and new problems and so on. Um, so I think you can broaden out what you mean by problem as well. Um, Paula, do you want to add anything about um, what kind of things you would do for year nine and 10 to prepare students for senior subjects in terms of maybe activities, assessments and so on? Paula, you're, on, you're on mute, Paula. Oh, they wish I was on mute all the time, my friend. No, no. <laughs> okay, I suppose um, from a Victorian perspective, we would certainly be wanting students to have um, a reasonably strong understanding of the, of the concepts, the underpinning structures. Um, so that that sense of transferability is there, that there's a bit of risk taking, that there's um, uh, a, an appreciation of what design means and that students are well versed in analysis. We often find that that seems to be an area that students aren't either interested in or they want a shortcut. Uh, they want to get to um, production, development, implementation, if they're if they doing that. So um, what we would be encouraging, well, I would be encouraging is that students are actually able to articulate and know the right types of questions, the concepts that they are dealing with, because that they become transferable. And when they get to more complex problems, then they actually have a framework to to help them and and i think that's something that we should be encouraging students right from the beginning that teachers aren't afraid to be using um, the concepts or the key framework and and i know that um, uh, lots of people like looking at the the ways of thinking they too become a form of pedagogy and a disposition that students can develop that will help them deal with more complex problems. Yeah, I think you saw me reaching for the hippo. Um, uh, I'm finished. <laughs> so um, the only thing I'd add to all of this is that Digital Solutions is a very project-oriented course. And I think oh. in year nine and 10, um, uh, in Queensland in particular, you'd want students to do at least one substantial project, a really substantial project, so they get a sense, am I the, am I the kind of personality that is gonna enjoy doing a substantial project that's more open-ended um, than perhaps assessment tasks in some of the other learning areas that they could be doing subjects in? So we, we definitely want a mix of all of the explicit teaching and the understanding the frameworks that um, Bruce and Paula mentioned. But in addition to that, we definitely want to make sure there's some good solid projects in there because honestly, the only way to learn how to do these things is to do projects, not get it right, do progressively larger projects and develop your own um, personal skills in terms of time management and all of those kind of things in addition to the, the technical skills too. James, can I just add that Victoria did um, five years ago change part of the curriculum in senior secondary to where about 50% of the work that students do is um, project work and 50% um, is other sort of discrete tasks for that very reason. And we also wanted to bring in a bit of project management and how to deal with um, contingencies when things don't go quite wrong, how do you respond? Yeah, and I think all states are probably moving in that direction. It's just a matter of when they uh, either have or will be reviewing their um, senior syllabuses over the next while. Great, thanks gang. So the next question, um, there's two questions that are similar to each other. So one from uh, Katrina Gordon, what resources are there for schools to be able to 
uh, able to utilize in terms of developing a strong digital technologies program for their school. Um, and the second part of that is especially for distance ed. And uh, Andrea Franklin also said, um, asked any suggestions on implementation in a distance ed context. Um, Bruce, I'm gonna hand that one to you first in terms of what we're already doing in the ACA and then we'll broaden out um, to Anna and Paula. Okay, yeah, we're very conscious in the ACA that there are a lot of um, students and schools that may not have reliable internet connections or may not have access to teachers with the expertise that might be present in the larger cities, for example, um, or more popular schools. So one of the ways that we've dealt, done that is when we've designed our digital technologies challenges, we have all of those challenges available as downloadable documents. And those documents include, for teachers in particular, all of the solutions to the coding activities, um, as well as the test cases that we run in our platform to assess the correctness of student solutions. So you can actually provide a lot of those questions and um, test scripts as a manual exercise for students to test their code against as a way of allowing them to do a lot of the programming stuff. But in addition to that, we've also built a number of offline activities and resources that you can find on our resources webpage under the DT at home and other ACA activities filters. And those are essentially, um, nice short sort of hour or two activities depending on the activity itself that explore a specific aspect of the um, digital technologies curriculum in a very accessible way so the idea is to make it so that it's so simply presented that um, if you have no idea about it you know if you're a parent who has never seen anything about digital technologies before or doesn't really understand education you could walk your, your, your child through that activity. Um, and as a result, those resources are fantastic for teachers to set as a task, either if there's a relief teacher or as a break from you know, some intensive project work, because there's a lot of really interesting discussion that can be had to engage students with that concept in a, in a more meaningful way once they're back in the classroom. Thanks, Bruce. Um, Anna, do you want to add anything to that one? Well, look, I'd also say have a good look at the Digital Technologies Hub because there's been a lot of work done by um, a, a lady called Nicola Flanagan, who is from Queensland, who was involved in the whole school implementation of digital technologies. And uh, she has um, some great resources there, particularly the message was uh, coming out of that, that example. It was a whole school approach and this is a primary school in Queensland and everyone had to be invested so from the, the parent community to uh, the staff and at that school uh, Digitech was everybody's business just like ICT so it's um there's there's some resources there to support you and in regard the distance ed um, I think uh, I had a conversation with uh, some distance ed teachers here in Queensland and what uh, they suggested is that anything that you do has to be um, done collaboratively so students can actually have time with the teacher, with everyone looking at particular, for example, coding or programming when they're debugging, everyone's involved. It's not just a, a student isolated on their own. So they were really, um, I suppose they emphasised the fact that their digital technologies um, delivery is done in group sessions as a collaborative approach. Thanks, Anna. Paula, do you want to add anything to that one? Um, hi, just a, a, a couple of things. I would just warn um, about the um, shopping cart mentality of going on to <clears throat> websites that have got these resources and filling up the cart. And um, at the end of the day, uh, there's either sequencing it wrong in the, because of the way in which you did it, um, there's only a um, limited coverage of the content descriptions. We often find that the evaluation aspect is dropped off the agenda uh, in, in what's being done. So I'm coming back and I'm looking at that part on a strong digital technologies program for the school. So I, I think the school needs to, um, as Anna was saying, looking at a whole school program um, approach and need to consider sort of things about, well, are you actually allocating the approximate amount of time so that coverage is possible? 
um, you know, if, if you're only giving the students a quarter of the time, then you've got to make some decisions about what's going in, what's out. What's the coherence? You've got to have meaningful connections with other learning areas, not ones which are convenient. So I think that coherence and convenient is really important. You've got to make certain that there's some building in complexity and that you've got the order in the continuity and the progression and um, that the programs are manageable, that what you are getting in those units of work uh, are of the right size um, and with the right timing. So yes, there's a lot of resources available, but just beware that you as the designer of the teaching and learning programs have to engage in sequencing, allocation, progression. Um, they just can't fall off the shelf into um, a timetable. Yep, great, thanks Paula. Now, I'm just before we, I'm gonna to go to my uh, last, last question before um, uh, we hopefully see some questions from the audience. I haven't seen any questions scroll by yet unless I've missed one. So while we answer this last question, if you've got any things that the conversation so far has prompted or if we answered one of your questions or didn't quite answer what you meant, feel free to just pop a message into chat now and we'll, we'll come back into a moment, come back to it in a moment. We're now going to a question from Leanne Cameron, um, who's right on the, the money at the moment. She's asked, what changes do we foresee will be made in the upcoming curriculum review? Well, that is a cat amongst the pigeons or more likely a pigeon amongst the cats. Um, uh, Paula, I'll go to you first. And this one is gonna require, probably everyone is gonna need the um, hippo. I'm going to back off the specifics and just talk in generalities. There was a management theory about uh, dynamic equilibrium and it talks about what happens when you change and you've got to do look at the, um, the triangle and say that to take people with you, you need to keep about 60%, 65%, 70% of what was there. You nudge about the next 20%, 15 to 20%. So you start to implement some changes and then you really take something bold, which is right at the top that's brand new. So we are aiming to not totally rock the boat. This is so that teachers better understand what the intention is. Um, at the moment, there's some ambiguity read my lips is what we're on about we really want some clarity but we're not going to throw everything out um, the aim is to nudge improve clarity and help better implement teachers implement the intention of the curriculum not even close to the hippo thanks paula anna i've been Look, practicing I absolutely agree with paula and what i would like to see is particularly for primary teachers as I've always said, this, is a brand, this was a brand new learning area. We as primary teachers had never been asked to teach a new learning area before. We've always had mathematics, English, science, geography, etc. Uh, we've had changes to the format of our curriculum. We've had uh, different ways of assessing, but this was brand new. And I think the issue was a, a lack of, I suppose, understanding of what it was, what it wasn't. And the content descriptions, as we've discussed many times, because of the limited amount of words or the, the actual limit to the number of content descriptions, we've had to put a lot of information into one content description. And we are, we've spent a lot of time unpacking and looking at ways to help teachers better understand terminology, the concepts. So I would like to see from this review, as Paula said, um, at, at I suppose my priority is that teachers, particularly in the primary years, have a much better understanding of what it is they have to teach. We know that unless you have a strong understanding of your learning area, you won't have the confidence to effectively teach. So that's what I would like to see of the review. Fantastic, thanks Anna. Bruce? Um, we reduce the number of ands and increase the number of content descriptions. <laughs> um, <laughs> So I think, I think one of the failings of the, the current curriculum is actually not the content itself, but the way that it is presented. 
I think we uh, have a number of content descriptions that attempt to do a little bit too much and that's created a lot of um, ambiguity or confusion for teachers and you know a really easy one to pick that just jumps out for, for people familiar with the, the the content is the year nine and ten one that links compression and document representation um, those are two very distinct concepts they were always intended to be two very distinct concepts and to try to mash those together is actually just going to confuse the students um, let alone you know give you a very sort of cohesive program. So I think one of the things I'd like to see in the review is just a cleanup of all of that, because I think increasing the number of content descriptions is actually going to reduce the complexity and the amount of content that gets taught. Um, if you teach documents, um, document representation independent of compression, you have very clear, distinct um, focus on each of those topics, and you can deliver those and you can move on. Trying to match those together, is going to create this very big, very nebulous thing that could take up a way more time in your, in, your, in your learning program. And we just don't have the, the time or the capacity in schools right now to deliver on that. So I'd like to see it back to our intention, which was to make sure that the learning is discrete, that everything is defined quite narrowly, and that will allow teachers to actually think about how they can make the connections that Anna was talking about, particularly in the primary years, which is going to have a significant impact on reducing that um, crowding that is you know, one of the things that the reviewers decided to focus on. Yeah, I um, uh, agree with all of the points so far. I mean, the way I would summarize it is that there seems to have been um, an assumption that the number of words that everything is described in equals the amount of classroom time that you actually need to teach a thing and that the content points were content descriptions were um, uh, if equal size to spend an equal amount of time on and that was never the case and is definitely not the intention of the, the the writing team so that being able to increase clarity so teachers need to do less work to understand what's going on is is definitely a thing we want to do if you haven't seen our unpacking the curriculum work um i've just put a link into chat aca.edu.au slash curriculum uh, or you can see the link at the top of the aca website unpack the curriculum that will actually give you a pretty good idea about some places where we um as the writing team last time round, would like to see um, some improvements. The other side, I think, is that the uh, elaborations are, um, uh, are something that we also think there's, we still need to do a lot of work on. The timeframes of writing the content descriptions was very short last time, and really a lot of the elaborations need work. So if you've ever opened up the elaboration and felt more mystified um, about the content description than you did before you read the elaborations, just occasionally in the writing team, we feel the same way. So that's another area that we'll be looking to improve things too. Now, I wanna to go to the um, uh, questions from the floor. I think we've um, got one question from uh, Kareen, um, uh, which then in response, she got 10 questions from the writing team back in return. So what do you suggest a school focus on if there's 50 minutes a week um, and the school requires four, sorry, 50 minutes per week for digital technologies and requires four assessment pieces per year. And this is uh, over 36 weeks for year seven students. And um, it looks like they uh, have an elective option in year eight. So in year seven, it looks mandatory. And then in year eight, it's elective. Thoughts, Bruce? So I guess the first thing would be see if you can argue for more time. Yeah. Um, the uh, design paper that is available on ACARA's website, not the Australian Curriculum website, the ACARA one under the curriculum section, uh, outlines the amount of time that writers were told to dedicate to their design of the curriculum for each subject. Um, and there is a technologies section there and the technologies and the digital technologies writers, uh, design and tech and tech, digital technologies writers, essentially working on 50% each um, of that allocated time. So really, we're talking 40 hours in year seven, 40 hours in year eight um, for, for year seven and eight of digital technologies. That's not of technologies, it's specifically digital. And so if you're not getting that amount of time, 
um, then realistically, the amount of content that is written into that E7 and 8 band is not going to fit in the time that you have. Um, so what I would say is see what students are bringing with them from primary school. Um, find out what your school is delivering in terms of their year eight, in your case, elective, as well as the year nine, 10 electives and have a look to see which topics and ideas are going to build best on the knowledge that students bring with them from primary school. Um, identify something new that's going to link really nicely with what they're going to do in those electives and build your program around those two things. That way you're reinforcing a lot of the foundations that students have developed and you're continuing to build on those because it is a progression curriculum that it's sequenced that way. Um, but it also means that you're setting them up for success when they choose the electives in the later year levels because they'll at least have made sure that they've had some exposure to those fundamental concepts that are going to be explored in greater detail. So there's a little bit of an analysis, I guess, of where they're coming from and where they're going to in your school sequence of learning that is going to be necessary there. Um, and you know, if you get, get that information and you're still unsure, um, feel free to send an email to us at help at aca.edu.au and I'll take a look and we'll see what we can do to help you out. Paula, do you want to add anything? Uh, to that? I just um, agree that I'm thinking of 56 minutes um, a week for 36 weeks. Um, you, you really, you go one step forward and two steps back. Um, you know, whether you can do a more intense semester, you have the problem uh, that you then have a gap the following semester. But um, when we ha have a skill base as well, which is looking at developing some fluency, some automaticity with what the students are doing, it's very difficult to be doing something um, for only one period a week. Um, and particularly when the students are doing their, their coding, um, it's not a great opportunity to be consolidating um, building. So, you know, one option, if it's possible, might be to do a more concentrated time and um, just do it per semester. Yes, there is a gap, but I, I just think given that we have a skill element there is a problem about that that lack yeah. of regular, even if it's small, regular um, work in that area. Yeah, agreed. I think, I mean, literally you're being asked to deliver 80 hours over two years in just 30 hours. I mean, it, it, and that is just no, no teacher can magician that out of the box. Um, I, the writing team would not. We would be storming the trenches of the principal's office. Uh, I know the politics is difficult, but you really need to go back and say, all right, well, this design document says this was written for 80 hours over two years. How do you propose that I deliver this to all of our students because it's mandatory um, in the 30 hours that has been allocated? And I think Paul is right, the smearing out um, over um uh, 50 minutes a week is just long enough to get the kids logged in start doing something and then have to wrap it up again so i think it's especially hard and no other highly practical subject uh, would that be considered acceptable you wouldn't be doing 50 minutes of woodwork um, because that is just long enough to basically get all of your pencil boxes back out of the cupboard put one more nail back in them and put them back again so i i think you have to continue to fight the good fight on that front and use the use the design document. The other thing I would say, uh, which kind of just adds to Bruce's comment, is focus on the things that they will need to build on later. So there are some things like learning about binary in year seven and eight that I would just say, nope, that's in the year eight um, uh, elective part. In fact, I would probably, if I had to, lose all of that data representation content description and say learning about um, text, image, and audio representations are a valuable thing, but not as valuable as really developing their um, uh, programming and data analysis skills. I mean, I can see Paul is sighing at the thought of losing content descriptions on the <laughs> down in Melbourne, but the reality is, is something's got to go when you're only doing 
30 of 80. And so unfortunately, I think it would be better to do a higher quality version of a smaller number of key skills and not try and spread yourself um, too thin. Um, we just got another question and team from Trish. Will the content descriptions be added to in the near future, e.g. artificial intelligence? What do we reckon, Sages? So I think, I think with given that the current um, discussion is about consolidating and removing content because it's crowded, I think the inclusion of AI is likely to be as a mechanism through which something that's in the curriculum could be explored. Um, I can't see it getting its own content description, potentially getting some elaboration mention, um, but that would be probably it, I think. Agreed. And in fact, Paula just said maybe elaborations. Just the instant you said that phrase. Yeah. Look, I, I agree. I think that the section that's analyzed and visualized data using a range of software, well, a range of software already gives you a fair bit of scope to do a bit of machine learning, for example. Um, uh, and as long as those activities were genuinely developing an understanding of data at the same time, I would support those being taught um, in conjunction. So AI, machine learning um, are definitely things of interest right now. Cybersecurity is another great example. And so with the ACA's um, school's cybersecurity challenges, we very much teach um, cybersecurity, which is a hot topic right now, especially we've even got ScoMo talking about it this week. Um, so uh, that's an example of something that's very current, um, but, but can be used as a vehicle for teaching a range of other things in digital technologies. I'm sure sometime in the future, the ACA will be developing new resources that tie AI to digital technologies. But there have been some projects to look at the relationship between AI and the Australian curriculum. So I wouldn't be surprised if we start to see some other resources or support materials appear in the near future. All right. Um, so I'm going to, uh, let's see, just checking um, uh, whether there are any other questions. I don't see any. You've got Where's one, there? James, that you flagged about professional learning that you were... Ah, thanks. Yes. Oh, that was actually the one that I did want to come back to. Thank you very much. So um, the, the last question we had in our um, initial questions was about... Um, uh, what do we recommend in terms of uh, professional learning if you're teaching digital technologies to year seven, eight and nine and 10? So there's a, a few different options there. Number one, if you're not already a member, get involved in your state's IT teachers association. So um, uh, we've got QSight, ICT, NSW, DLTV, EdTech SA, ECOA, ECAWA in um, Western Australia, TASITE, INTIACT in the ACT, um, and uh, Sue, I think Sue Carter's on the line. We don't have an association in Queensland, but we've literally written down Sue Not Carter. So <laughs> Sue, you're there, um, and Sue's an absolute champ for getting things going up in the ACT. That's, that yeah, would be my first starting yeah. point. Sorry, not the ACT, NT. <laughs> um, sorry about that, Sue much better to live in the NT than the ACT. Um, so uh, that's number one. Number two, the, um, I would strongly recommend the CSER MOOCs. So even though that program, um, the, the funding is finished at this point, but the MOOCs themselves are still available. They're a great way to go. Um, there are some MOOCs that are targeted specifically for um, the uh, lower secondary digital technologies curriculum. So go and have a look at those. The um, uh, DT Hub and our ACA webinar series and then a bunch of other webinars around the place. We'll be bringing back our webinar program in term three as well. I think we'll do another um, uh, question and answer session on the curriculum uh, with the writing team. We might even do a session specifically on feedback and ideas for how to improve uh, the next draft. Um, something that we have at Sydney University is we have a Masters of Education in Digital Technologies. 
and that's designed to really give you um, a, a, a strong um, grounding in all of the things you need to teach in digital technologies right up to um, year 11 and 12, depending on which um, uh, electives you take in that MED. Uh, Michelle uh, Chomiak, who's just said woo um, on chat, is currently doing the MED. Um, so we've got our first cohort going through, getting very positive feedback so far. Um, the other thing I would suggest is that um, as well as looking at professional learning, you should be thinking, what things can I do where I learn along with my students? Um, now, it's a brave path to take as a teacher to say, look, I don't know the answer to all of these things myself, but I'm going to learn along with you. I've found always that when you do that, the, the students actually really enjoy it and you get an opportunity to model good learning behavior. But you want to do it in the context of an activity that is going to give you support when you as a teacher are still stuck as well. And so um, either the DT challenges themselves are a great thing because we have the ACA helpline um, uh, that uh, you can, you know, you can send us an email to help at aca.edu.au or we've got a phone number you can ring or starting in term three, it's a paid for activity um, that we've been running for the past 15 years at the University of Sydney called the NCSS Challenge. Um, it's an online programming competition where you learn to program over the five weeks of the competition. And we have about 120 um, industry and university volunteers who come in and help tutor on the platform. So if you can find activities like those where you can learn at the same time yourselves, but also get that backup support where you need it, that's a great way to continue to learn um, as a teacher whilst um, being, doing that while you're still, you know, having to juggle classroom time and everything else like that. All right. Well, I think at this point we've um, we've run out of questions. Um, uh, next week um, we've got our final webinar um, for um, the uh, for this term, and it's going to be two separate sessions on for primary and secondary teachers on assessing digital technology. So if you go to the ACA website and look up um, our webinars or go to the short URL Bruce has just put up here, cmp.ac slash webinars, you can um, uh, register for either the primary or the secondary one. Uh, they're gonna run in parallel. If you wanna watch both of them, then you can always watch the recording of the second one. And that'll bring us to the end of this um, term's webinar series. If you've got any other ideas for webinars or things you would like to have as a topic, would love to see you just leave a comment for us in chat um, before you go today. Um, and um, uh, if not, feel free to send an email to help at aca.edu.au or leave a message on our Facebook, post, uh, Facebook um, group about what you'd like to see in webinar series um, coming up. So just like to finish up by thanking Paula, Anna and Bruce uh, for their contributions today. I have to say it's an absolute professional highlight of mine to be able to work with this gang. We always have a great time when we're together and we're, um, <laughs> we're really looking forward to doing a little bit of polishing um, on our baby as it turns eight um, from its first birth. Um, and hoping that teachers will, um, uh, will get involved in those discussions too so we can have a great tweaked version of the Australian Curriculum Digital Technologies. Thanks very much, everyone. Have a great evening. Thanks, James. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye.